So do you think we can go yet? <laughs> Why are you looking at your watch? <laughs> I know, I was looking at the date, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it looks like in Malaysia they have relaxed the lockdown rules and regulations, so we can leave the marina, but not before a few jobs first. Wow, the growth doesn't look that particularly bad, or is it quite bad? What do you think? Well, what I did was I actually scraped two thirds of the boat two months ago. And back then there was loads of what we incorrectly call coral worm. I don't know what it actually is, but it's very easy to scrape off. But there was a lot of it and it was all over the boat, everywhere. Uh, so I did that and then I couldn't do the last bit because it was up the bit up close to the pontoon it was difficult to get to and also I thought well I'll actually record the last bit just to show you the difference between the growth and the bit that I'd scraped. Now the prop needed a lot of work there were all sorts of things growing on that I, I don't know whether it was a clam or a big mussel uh, but I had to stab away at that and of course I have to do the, sh the shaft as well. So those are the most important things because obviously we want ki some kind of steerage when we leave the marina. So when you're stabbing away like that, is that doing any damage to the boat? I'd like to think it isn't. I mean, unfortunately, you know, with that bronze prop, you really do have to stab away at the kind of, uh, at the top layer. Uh, and then once you've got rid of the first part, you then scrape away. And the most important thing, of course, is to make sure you've scraped away all the growth on the leading edges of the prop because that is where you're going to get most of your drive from. Uh, but I spent enough time down there to actually finish the prop off and make it look like new. Yeah, it did look good. And one of the things we've been thinking about for ages is whether to use prop speed or not. And it's the jury's out, although I have spoken to a number of people who say it does work. And I think we should think about it next time, you know. Yeah, I think the, the reason why we ducked out of it when we hauled out last time was the expense. Um, you really need to go halves with another yachty because you have to buy it in a certain amount and that's enough to paint your prop, prop three or four times. So I think whilst we're in tropical waters, we can continue to dive down and scrape the prop whenever. Mm. But I think as we go into colder climates, putting on something like prop speed uh, is probably a good idea. Looks like there's a lot of fish down there. What did you think? Amazing. I think during the lockdown, we all recognised how much nature was taking over once more. And that was evident in the waters in the marina. Of course, you've got no boats going in and out, so there's no diesel in the water, very little rubbish. The water clarity improved massively over those last few months. And as you say, so many fish. And of course, they absolutely love all of that stuff you're scraping off the boat. And as you can see, I was surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of reef fish. Of course, every time we looked in the water throughout the months we've been there, there were hundreds of fish. You could just see them with the naked eye. And in the evening and the mornings, they were jumping, weren't they? All around the marine, the waters were frothing. It was like being right out in the wilds. So cleaning the hull and the prop and so forth, that was the first job actually that you did. The only time I ever do that is I feel like I go down a little bit of a sponge, but it's very much your job. What I, else do we have I to don't do? remember the last time you did that, <laughs> to be honest. OK, what else do we Well, there was a few things. Obviously, we've been sitting in the marina for some months, so things like stainless work uh, had to be cleaned, and that's a job I really do not like. Fortunately, we knew a man with a dog who had a friend called Madsen, and he's a local guy. He actually worked on another friend's boat that's also painted, not GLP, mm. it's painted. And that boat, every time we went on it, was spick and span. It was a beautiful looking boat. Yeah, and that was thanks to Madsen. So we got Madsen to come over to our boat. Uh, he polished the stainless. He also washed the decks, washed the top sides, and he even polished the top sides as well. Yeah, I mean, lazy of us not to do it. We do normally do it, and I even occasionally do the stainless. But it's so hot and humid in the yeah. marina. Yeah. Also, it gives a local guy some employment. We were able to pay him. Um, and in the lockdown, a lot of local people have had no income. So it was good to be able to use him. And mm. I think he appreciated it. Mm. The other thing that I did, which is uh, worth noting, is getting rid of the water in the uh, petrol jerry cans for your outboard. 
This is something that you should really do regularly. Invariably, your jerry cans will get water in them, especially if you leave your jerry can in your dinghy and it gets rained on and so on. But yeah, even just the moisture will collect in those jerry cans. We have once actually run our jerry can down to the bottom and yeah. ended up running through water, yeah. water through uh, outboards. So I didn't want to repeat of that. So that was just a simple process of borrowing a jerry, an empty jerry can, tipping it through our double uh, water separator filter mm -hmm. and then tipping it back again just to get rid of all the water. Mm -hmm. But I really do recommend that. The other thing, of course, is that we got our outboard serviced in Miri. Yes. And it that got a good. really good overhaul. And of course, we hadn't used it since then. <laughs> so really important to run your outboard. If you're in a marina, run it before you leave the marina because you don't want problems when you get to your anchorage. So the outboard, all good. And talking of outboards, uh, it's a good job you did that because it wasn't all work, work, work as we prepared to leave. We took a small break one day with a few friends in the marina and we took our dinghies out into the ocean to the nearest island. It was nice, wasn't it? Mm. What are you doing, Magda? It's a Sunday. We're going for a, a Sunday afternoon drive into the countryside. Actually, we're going to go to the islands just over there. Uh, we've had to wait for Roy, who's got a brand new engine. Uh, he's got an eight horsepower enduro. Uh, Graham's also got a new outboard. He's got a 15 horsepower enduro. So they're both running their engines in. And Roy, unfortunately, had to uh, trim away and eventually drill off the plate of the transom here so that he could fit his on. So, the only thing we've got to worry about now is that. So these are our new oars, which we had to get uh, specially adapted because they didn't fit in the Rollocks. And we got this turned, this bit of plastic collar, turned and drilled. That cost 130 ringgit. That's about 25 quid. It's not bad, is it? With a storm brewing over the land, we decided we would take that trip, about two and a half nautical miles out of the marina, across the open sea to two or three little islands there. Um, I got a bit annoyed with you because you didn't know which island we were going to and you didn't know what it was called, you didn't know anything about it. <laughs> Absolutely no preparation whatsoever. None at all. I did take a, VH, a handheld VHF, but of yeah. course I didn't agree with the others what channel we should be using. No. We had no idea what the names of the islands were. It, there was no preparation to this trip at all. It was really just get the hell out of the marina and thrash those, not thrash those outboards actually, they were running theirs in. So yeah. gently pootle over to those islands. Yeah, keeping an eye on each other, making sure we we're all okay. But uh, yeah, don't advise to do it the way we did it. Do a little bit of prep before you go out. Mystery Island tour. Um, we've beached the dinghies and we've got to go and register and do their old uh, temperature check and a landing fee of 10 ringgit, that's about two quid. This is all rather strange actually, it's a bit of a culture shock having been out to uh, tourist places like this in obviously months and months and this is a proper resort, they have a swimming pool, uh, they've got a lifeguard station, restaurant, uh, reception area which is where we've got to check in and uh, swimming areas, places to drop off, speed but I mean this is, it's all very normal I suppose but it's just really quite strange coming somewhere like this for the first time in six months or so. So it turns out this resort is really quite well established. Uh, they've got proper beach bungalows over there. Uh, we've checked in. Uh, there's a landing fee of 10 ringgit for us youngsters. Uh, Liz gets in free because she's really old so she gets in for nothing. We found out a little bit more about the island. It's funny isn't it? We came Steaming over here in the dinghies, uh, none of us knew the name of the island, did any research at all. We just said, right, let's go over there. This is Manukan Island, and according to my research assistant, this was the first island that was made a national park. According to Liz, she said the first one in Malaysia. I've just seen a sign over there saying it was uh, gazetted as a national park in 1979. I really can't believe that uh, it was only that recently that Malaysia started turning some of these places into national parks. Over here we've got a great big tank, saltwater tank. It's 
a little bit murky, but inside I can see uh, a reef shark, a little tipped reef shark, and there's some big, I don't know what they are, angel fish and a couple of other fish inside there. It's very murky, look. There's the reef shark. It's coming round. Here he comes. We ended up on the island of Manikan, and that's part of the Tunku Abdul Rayman National Park. At the time, we hadn't done any research, and I did a quick Google when we were over on the island and found out that it was the first marine national park in Malaysia. Well, that was completely wrong. Mm. It wasn't at all. Um, it's the second national park in Borneo. Uh, but nevertheless, there are five islands of which Gaia is the biggest and Manukan is one of the smallest ones. But the thing with Manukan is it seems to be the main one. It's the most developed, as we saw. There's quite a resort there um, with all kinds of facilities in it, uh, which we looked at while we were there. Well, it may be cloudy and overcast, but uh, it's really rather special coming to a little island like this. And even with all those clouds, there is an incredible view of the mainland's over there. In fact, the clouds add a bit of atmosphere. Those clouds we were seeing earlier, there was a big squall cape, well, storm uh, was passing over and we thought it was heading this way, but I think it's kind of broken up a bit and headed into town. Uh, but listen to this, isn't it so tranquil? Just the sound of the sea breaking on the uh, shore there. Lovely. Thinking about it, this was actually our first trip out of the marina since lockdown. That's five months. Five I months. Yeah. I mean, normally when we're sailing around, this is what we do all the time. We yeah. find an island, drop the hook, go ashore and explore, sail around it, blah, blah, blah. So for me, I don't know how you felt about this, but for me, it felt rather strange actually dropping the dinghy on the beach, uh, walking ashore, chatting to a few local people. And, it kind of conjured up old memories that yes. are long forgotten. Yes, because we've, we've become so institutionalised in mm. the marina with our very daily, you know, regular things happening in the marina and our very, just the four walls around us. Suddenly there's all this open space. Slight trepidation because we are still in lockdown and in Sabah you're supposed to wear a mask at all times. In fact, I did take one with me. Um, and we were meeting people and although the resort was open, you know, it, it was open and there were people working there. It's kind of, oh, OK, we've got to, it's great to see them, but we've got to stand away a little mm. bit. Mm. Uh, but yeah, the idea of actually being out, God, it really made us want to go out immediately with <laughs> Esper, didn't it? Yeah, we were eyeing up little anchorages around that island. But of course, it's a national park and you, you can't anchor around there. You're not no, allowed to. No, can't take your boat. Can't take your boat. Dinghy was all right. I had a little swim, I enjoyed that. Yeah, you and Magda had a nice little well, paddle, did. didn't you? Yeah. And although we had that big storm that was hanging over oh, yeah, yeah. KK, we managed to avoid it as Yeah, well. I think we had a few spots of rain, mm. that was all, in, and actually KK completely disappeared. There was just blackness where mm. KK and the marina was. So it was lovely to sit back and watch it. So that little dinghy trip basically kick-started us into saying, right, it's time to go. Next up, of course, we have to check out because in Malaysia, you don't just check out of the country, you have to check out of each port as you come and go from them. Novelty day to day, something special is happening. We're actually checking out. Can you believe that? Yep, we are planning to leave the marina on Esper this time. And uh, in Malaysia, you have to check out of each port, um, which is a minor inconvenience, but it is what it is. Uh, the most important uh, people to check out with is the Jabatan Laut and uh, that's basically the Harbour Master stroke Coast Guard stroke Marine Department. Problem is is that it's about 20-25 kilometres away. All the other offices of course are in town uh, but this one requires a bit of a car journey so I've asked our friend Jasley who is the skipper on board one of the boats here um, if I could borrow his car and he said oh, don't worry I'll drive you there. So I thought I'd just record this just to show you the process if I'm allowed to and hopefully, possibly, we'll see if it happens but we'll go and discover a special little uh, treat which is famous in this part of uh, uh, Sarawak, no? Where are we? Sabah. I haven't had enough coffee. Anyway, here we go.
Hello. 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 Thirty-five point three. Thirty-five point three. That means yeah. I'm, uh, I'm almost dead, aren't I? <laughs> uh, you In your way, British studio. Also British. But we haven't been back for two years. Two years? Yeah. Long time. Uh, so basically in a nutshell, what they're after is your port clearance uh, from your last port, which was obviously Miri. Um, and then we have a crew list, which they had previously stamped when we came in. So we show them that crew list as well. And uh, the idea is, is that at the end of this process, they issue us with a port clearance document, uh, which you would have uh, whether you left the country or in the case of Malaysia, whether you leave the port. This means when we go out to Kudat, we present our port clearance paper from KK to Kudat. Good fun, eh? So, interesting development. It, uh, currently, the Jabatan Lao has received a memo saying that officially I'm not allowed to leave the harbour and move around Malaysia. Um, but of course, we've got this rally coming up. So, they've actually asked to speak to Alvin, uh, which he's doing right now, to confirm that uh, we're staying within Malaysia and that currently we're just planning to go up to Kudat. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, much easier if Alvin deals with this, to be honest. Dia termasuk ke dalam masa ini? Sama juga kan? Ada kita hanya benarkan dia keluar terus. Ya. Keluar terus. Tapi kalau dia masih consider stay, macam mana? Macam contoh lah, kapal dia stop di marina tu tidak berjalan. It's an interesting development there, or rather non-development. I don't have my port clearance uh, because the Jabatan Louts showed me a document. It's actually dated back from February, um, saying that uh, we are still not allowed to leave the port. Um, anyway, Alvin's going to deal with them and he's told us to go to another building in back in town to see if we can get a special port clearance from this other office. Confused? I am, definitely. So on our way back to the other office we have stopped off on this one street which is famous for pudding kalapa which is basically a coconut pudding and it's particular to this area. Oh. Here comes a police police car. Someone's been naughty. I hope it's not me. And um, it's a special pudding that's kind of gelatinous, which they make in the coconut shell itself and then put on ice. It's very trust me, it's very delicious. Let's go and have a look. Well, that's takeaway. Yeah, takeaway. Takeaway. This also we can take away. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you can. Uh, you want to eat here? You can take away. Let's take away. Yeah. Take away. Or yeah, yeah. So Jazli has put it in simple English so idiots like me can understand. <laughs> uh, so this is the Jabatan Laut uh, at a federal level. So they are towing the federal line and that federal line is the document that dates back from February uh, to say that still no transit allowed. Uh, we're now going to go to the state Jabatan Laut which is a different department and they're going to be towing the local Sabah line which we are hoping inshallah will be a little bit more flexible so that's where we're going now. So we're at the busy Api Api uh, complex now and uh, somewhere on the sixth floor is the uh, state department that I've got to try and find so somewhere up there. So just grabbing two seconds to explain that this is the local port authority and uh, there was a big queue which bothered me a bit but Jasley's just explaining that the majority of people that you see behind me queuing up are actually just renewing licenses so there's quite a few fishermen in there with licenses oh I'm being called back in Hello. Uh, hello. 
This uh, issue, they talking about your boat will stay in here more than one month, supposed to be. So they have charges for like your boating charge uh, in the area in in Sabah. So it just cost you only the, uh, two cent per day. So it, because the MCO time, so they only calculate for only twenty eight days. You will stay in Sabah uh, above from your time in Sabah already more than one month. So it just cost you about fifty six cent, but the minimum charges only two ringgit. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's your okay. charges for us. No. Thank you. Okay. Just got a couple of fees to pay. Uh, there's a tonnage fee. It basically amounts to 28 ringgit, which is about five pounds sterling, which is not much. And in among all this, it turns out that uh, Jazz, one of Jazzy's uncles, works here. That's that man there. Uh, he works behind the counter. So getting to meet Jazzy's family as well. And finally, it turns out we haven't got to go to customs and immigration. Because we're staying within KK, um, within this area for the moment, we don't need to do that. So this is the fun part. This is where uh, they ask about our YouTube channel. And uh, this young lady here has actually just subscribed to our channel. Do you want to wave? Because you're going to be on our channel soon. <laughs> And told them the sad news about Millie, of course, which is very sad. But uh, anyway, lovely, friendly, mm -hmm. friendly service. Mm -hmm. Love it here. And just like that, back on the boat, back on the boat. And uh, since I haven't had breakfast, I'm tucking into my pudding kalapa. And Liz has yet to try this. She's never tried it before, so I'm interested to see what she thinks of it. Um, but this is what it looks like. That pudding kalapa, I just love that dessert. It's so tasty, but that's the first time you've had it, isn't it? Yeah, I was jealous because uh, when we checked in, you had that and I didn't. And again, this time I didn't need to go with you, so I thought, oh, I'm going to miss it. It was lovely that you brought some back for me, and I loved it. It was really nice, like a gelatinous, natural coconut milk. In fact, really filling, but lovely, mm. yeah. Mm. As you saw, there was a little bit of confusion going on with checking out. Uh, and I explained that, of course, there are two harbour masters and or rather port authorities there. So called. one for the country and one for the state, was yes. that it? OK. And we realised afterwards, of course, that this is unprecedented. Yeah. I think we are the first boat to check out of the port, but not the country. Yeah. So there were a few super yachts that were in the lockdown with us in the marina who have gone on to other countries like the Philippines. Yeah. So for the port authority, that was easy. They just checked them out the country. But for us, we were only checking out of the port area, but staying within Sabah. And yeah. that caused a lot of confusion. And we've seen this, not just with other yachts, but with the local authorities as well. There doesn't seem to be a clear line on what is and what is not they're the learning, correct procedure. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. learning along with us, aren't they? And mm. it's, it's great that we've got Alvin, uh, who you mentioned, and he's based in the marina and he services all the big yachts and he's been fantastic looking mm. after us as well. Mm. And it was great you were able to get him on the end of the line just to sort it out. He didn't know, they didn't know, but it, in the end it was done, wasn't it? It was all okay? <laughs> I think so. I think so. We'll find out when we check in at the next port in a few weeks' time. So with all that done, we're ready to leave. Yes. And sadly, this is the first time we'll be leaving any marina and going to an anchorage without our dear little Millie. Uh, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Yes, yeah, it's, still, it's still too raw um, to talk about Millie. I'm sure those of you who follow us will know that. Um, she's constantly on our minds all the time and everything about the boat and everything reminds us of her all the time. But we will talk about Mills a little bit more next week. Yeah, well, let's finish on a positive. As we left the marina, I was chatting to Roy. Remember Roy, of, famous Roy of Roy's Ropes, who we covered? Uh, he became our neighbour for many months in the lockdown. And I was talking to him about how I hate going in and out of marinas. Mm. And the main reason for that is that Esper has prop walk. And prop walk is when your shaft is offset at a certain angle, either to port or to starboard. So what happens is when we go into a stern, because you don't have enough power, the wash from the prop is stronger than the direction of your rudder. 
And because our prop is set off to starboard, we have a prop to port. I wanted to turn to starboard as we went into a stern getting out of the slip mm. and uh, I was concerned that this never ever works. Because mm, Desper wants to go the other way. Correct. Yeah. And Roy, bless him, said, ah mate, you just want to give it a bit of a burst. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. So here's a little tip for you. If you do have prop walk and you're trying to get out of a slip or you want to reverse into a straight line, as you know, when you're in a low tick over, you don't get in a straight line. It takes some meters before you can go in an absolute straight line. Give it a burst and then put it in neutral. Mm. It worked? Absolutely, yeah, because what you're doing is you're creating enough wash from the prop, stopping the prop, and then the remainder of that wash is obviously moving against the rudder, which is pointing in the right direction. And I think, I have to say, I think that was the cleanest exit I've ever done out of a marina. So thank you, Roy, for that little tip. And thanks to all the boats that came to see us off. Everybody mm. came down. We've all become really good friends, as you can probably imagine, close together like that for so long. It was sad to leave them all, but mm. to be honest, um, I needed to get out and we needed some space, didn't we? So it was good to go.